What kind of frog needs money? I don't know. A budget's frog. <laughs> Deadly Tarantula Girl coming to you from 2022. The new year is a time for new ideas, so we're trying out some new things. This video is 30 minutes long with multiple segments. We have some exciting things coming. Stay tuned. What's wrong with this one? Anton, I am your father. What are you guys doing? Cyclops man on the prowl. What are you doing? What do you mean? <laughs> hey, hey uh, what are you doing? Uh, Even though we have a lot of fun, Midwest Tongs is where we get all of our supplies like the mini tongs, the standard hooks, the tub pullers, the field hook, the grabbers, the large python hook, and more. Check out MidwestTongs.com. Give that to me. And the most important piece, the life-saving device that we have actually used, the Venom Lock. Remember, no animals were harmed in the filming of this video, nor should any animals ever be harmed with tongs.com equipment. This is Deadly Tarantula Girl coming to you on the first day of winter. My crew and I have been building this big winter barn for my mini horses and pygmy goats because we got hit with a killer blizzard last year and we didn't want to be left unprepared again this winter. So we built this beautiful barn out of a very old structure. I have no idea what the square footage is. There was just some old bones here and we just started building. We finished the south door earlier this week. We're gonna build this big west door next. It's gonna be a sliding barn door and that'll be the last piece. And so uh, this is little Mira, my two year old Mare. She just wanted to say hello to you guys today and show you guys the winter barn. Okay, so you'll have to forgive the mess. This was an impromptu video and this is a barn used by livestock. So we're gonna take a quick peek at the stalls. All right, this is the largest stall. This is the stall for my biggest brood mare. Then next, so this is for Rose. This is for Bo, my old stallion. The next is for Miram, the little mare that you just saw. This is for Storm, my little two-year-old chocolate mare. This is for Atlas, my pinto gelding. And this is for my other stallion, Wilder. And then over there we have kind of a large feed storage area where I keep hay and some of the grains and a little bit of tack. You'll have to forgive the trailer and the lumber that we have out here. We're literally still in the progress of this build. This is the solar lamp that we installed a few weeks ago. I have a cute little weather vane up there. And this is the south door that we just installed. It is on hinges. This is large enough for anything that goes into my barn. Then I have the storage area over here. We got this done. We're putting the last door up before any major winter storms, which I feel really good about. I know those stalls are very tiny, but those are only for sleeping during inclement weather. And if we have a serious blizzard or something like that, I actually have a summer barn that's much larger and spacious, but it's very open. And so this is for if anybody needs any special dietary supplements, or I put them in here to sleep when it's under 40 degrees. You can see they're all fuzzy. They have their nice warm winter coats on, but we're not gonna lose any animals this winter. I feel very accomplished and I'm very happy with this barn. We built it out of salvaged materials, 
bought materials and with our own two hands. I really love it. So if you want to see that big west door go up, stay tuned and I will post an update if I get requests. This package is from Taylor Don, one of my favorite authors right now, and that's saying a lot because I do a lot of reading. She is an incredible person. She is a ball python breeder as well. She's also the mother of three very naughty prairie dogs, which keep me laughing on social media. So I will drop the link to her social media accounts below, as well as list my favorite three Amazon books. I have to apologize for how crazy overdue this was, but Taylor sent me her newest book that came out. She's working on a top secret project right now, as well as getting into, I don't know what you would call it, like paranormal investigation, which, okay. <laughs> That's interesting. Speaking of which, I found uh, this really strange like haunted mansion that I was thinking about going and visiting called Hill House in Texas, maybe before I go to the next NARBC. And so if you wanna bunk up with me there, let me know, maybe we can plan a trip. Alrighty, so here is the book. This is book two in the McLaughlin Brothers trilogy. And this book is called Tavish and it is by my friend, a USA Today best-selling author. These books are pretty racy, which I enjoy. She has a very tasteful, eloquent way of kind of escalating these relationships and the dynamics in the story. Many of her books kind of are based on the enemies to lovers trope, which I really enjoy. She did send this to me autographed, which I love. These books will never be leaving my collection. They're amazing. She's by far my favorite author that is also in the exotic animal industry. All my love to Taylor Don. Can't wait to crack into this. I've decided to start adding some inspiration to my videos. That's kind of a New Year's resolution. So this was said by the famous Wayne Gretzky. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Today, I'm gonna to be showing you one of my beautiful Postlotheria metallica, also known as, well, a lot of things actually, but most commonly, the Goody Sapphire Ornamental Tarantula. It's a beautiful winter day, so I thought I would just snatch up this opportunity to show you what this animal looks like in natural light. It's not directly sunny here, but hopefully my cameras are still gonna capture the beauty of this animal. Let's take a look. I have this lovely gal in one of the acrylic Zilla arboreal tanks. And it has been really awesome. We enjoy it. She recently molted. And so this is not gonna be a long video. Don't wanna do anything to put her potentially in harm's way or stress her out, but she looks so beautiful. So here's her little nest and her molt. Ooh, there she is crawling up. She looks beautiful. Okay, so I'm just gonna very gently try to coax her out onto this log. So hopefully you guys can get a good look. Come on, sweetheart. Woo not a mudlanger. Okay. There we go. All right. Mm. There we go. Come on up. Oh, there we go. All right. So I wanted to show her to you now because she has just molted again. And so her colors are gonna look as bright and beautiful and dynamic as possible. This is the only species of Postlotheria that has blue chromatophores, which makes it very unique because most of them are very earthy tones like mossy greens, browns, yellows, tans. And so they have the markings on the abdomen that most Postlotheria share 
Their personalities are similar. So they're arboreal. This is a tropical arboreal species, but they are very unique because they are blue. They do not develop discoloration until they get closer to maturity. And then once you have your males reach their ultimate molt, they often look much more dull while the females look as bright and beautiful as possible. And you can see she's looking really good. So this is a relatively medium to fast growing species that grow to be about six to eight inches. The lifespan of the males is about five years and the lifespan of the females is more like 12 to 14 years. This one came from Rob from Ibn's Arachnids. We're Facebook friends and he was just commenting and I was responding to him on the channel earlier today. So Rob, this video is for you. You were asking how the babies that I got from you were doing and you can see this two, two year old female is looking quite fine. I personally do not power feed any of my animals. I like them to grow up very naturally and organically because I have found in my experience, I used to get a baby animal and I was so excited to grow it up. I would power feed it and do everything I could to almost kind of like force sexual maturity so they could reproduce. And I discovered that often animals would have shortened lifespan due to health complications. Their reproduction often was reduced so like uh, sizes of egg sac and in snakes, I'd get fewer eggs and things like that. Now I let my animals take their time and grow up and I'm very satisfied with her and she is very beautiful. It's not super warm out and so I don't wanna keep her out for too long, but I hope you enjoyed this natural outdoors look at my Goody Sapphire Ornamental or my Postlotheria Metallica as she enjoyed visiting with you guys. There is a lot of talk about Metallica having, oh, I should say Postlotheria Metallica because that's not the only Metallica species. Genus Postlotheria species Metallica, their venom being medically significant. Now, scientifically speaking, that is not accurate. Medically significant has a different meaning than what many people use it for. Their venom is not medically significant. That's technically incorrect. Do they have a potent venom that's going to make you regret getting bitten? Most definitely. But uh, unless you have other compromising health concerns, this will not be a fatal bite. It's just going to be one that you feel really sad about. Another thing is this species has been listed as critically endangered. And I want you all to know that this was an animal that was captive born and bred for the purpose of conservation. So big thanks to you, Rob. What did the snail say when riding the turtle? I don't know what. Woohoo! I hate this. <laughs> this package today is very special. It was sent to me by Mr. Craig Trumbauer. Now I need to clarify. Taylor Don is my favorite fictional writer. Craig Trumbauer is my favorite non-fictional writer. He writes tales from the field and funny anecdotes and they're riveting. I absolutely love reading them. This package was a surprise gift from Mr. Trumbauer and I messaged him and I was gushing that I was so excited and he never even messaged me back. <laughs> He's a very busy man. Okay, nicely packaged. Ooh, it's thick. <laughs> This is a spinoff of his previous book. And so it makes sense that it would be called even more than snake hunting. This book is filled with humor and amazing stories. All the cover artwork was done by Damon Salsaius. And it's really funny because this is an amazing character of Craig. And then he has the little stars pointing to some of the other characters in the book. And so just opening it immediately, he signed it with a personalized message to me, a kindred soul. And um, I just love that. So this is published by Eco Herpetological Publishing and Distribution. And also Russ Gurley is very involved with his writing and his books. And right away he has a sweet picture. 
showing that this book is dedicated to his grandchildren. It was written in memory of Bill Haas, which, oh, if you don't know who that is, just Google him. Wow. He passed in 2011, and I definitely will be linking this book from Amazon so all of you guys can buy it. If you're interested in reptiles in any way, I would read that um, because this is really how the industry got started was gentlemen going out into the wild and studying animals and learning about their husbandry firsthand. So Craig is one of those heroes and I love him. You may have to fight a battle more than once to win it, Margaret Thatcher. I'm doing a quick segment on my Tribulonatus gracilis, also known as the red-eyed croc skink. This is a beautiful species from New Guinea. I believe that there are eight different species of croc skink, and what separates this one is the red or orange ring around the eye. They don't have that when they're babies. They just look kind of black when they're little, and they just look like a little miniature adult when they're small. When they first hatch out, they're really tiny, about an inch or two, and they grow to be about 10 inches long. So this is a tropical forest dwelling species that is terrestrial. They are quite shy and they can drop their tails, similar to other species of lizards. One thing that makes them unusual is their very small size, the distinct scalation that does resemble crocodiles, although they are not a species of crocodile, they are technically in the skink family. This is a species that likes warm temperatures of about 75 to 85 Fahrenheit and high humidity of about 70 to 90%. And so this is an animal that does best in a reasonably small enclosure. One to two animals can be in as small as the 10 gallon, as long as there's multiple hides and logs and things that they can go hide under. And they can actually live communally in something as small as a 20 gallon tank. If you're gonna have a large community, I would suggest like a 50 long or something like that. Because they need more humidity, it's best if they're in a glass or plastic enclosure with some kind of mesh top because it's very important that they have full spectrum lighting. These animals either need to be on an automated mister or they need to be manually misted two to four times a day. You wanna make sure that you're not misting them with cold water as they do need to stay warm. And some people, a lot of people even use a heat mat underneath to boost the humidity and make sure that they have plenty of warm places to hide. You can use paper substrate or other things that can be cleaned as they are prone to bacterial infection. But you can also set up a bioactive enclosure where you have other small animals eating the detritus the females, oh, they are sexually dimorphic. They can vocalize very uniquely. They have a number of different sounds that they make, such as barking and things like that. That's a very unique to the species. And their vocals are sexually dimorphic as well as their physical appearance. So that's really interesting. The females will lay one egg about every 60 days. You can pull it and incubate it yourself, or if you have a nice bioactive enclosure or she has a suitable place to lay, you can let her keep the eggs. Some people have a fully automated setup where they have a mating pair or two and the animals raise their own young and only when there become too many members of offspring in the enclosure do they start branching out and either selling the babies or setting up new enclosures. This is a specimen that was bred and reproduced in captivity. This was not an animal that was taken out of the wild. And in fact, New Guinea does not allow the export of the species, although there are other countries that they can come from. So I highly recommend that if you're interested in this species, that you study it carefully. They are, I would say, an intermediate level so my very first red-eyed croc skink, which I've had my heart set on the species for a long time, came from Earl from Lone Star and Wren out of Lone Star Reptiles. And so that baby is the nearest and dearest to my heart. And I love that little one. I'm very excited to have an adult pair and I'm hoping to reproduce them in 2022. 
This package came from Mr. David Jakes, who is a legend in his own right. This man was a mentor to some of my mentors, like Stu Tennyson. And these photographs, we've talked about a lot of stuff, but I suspect these photographs are about one of the first leading ladies in the industry. And so to me, that's, these are treasures. And so I'm very excited about opening this package and we will see what is inside. All right, so this is two copies of an old Chicago Herp Society bulletin. So this is a 2006 edition. These look like duplicates. Ooh, this one is signed. This one was signed by Mr. Jakes. And so he was the one that wrote Death from Snakebite, the intertwined histories of Grace Olive Wiley and Wesley H. Dickinson. Amazing. If you're not familiar with these printings, they, I, I save things like this because this is history in the making. Here she is. Original photographs. Well, these are obviously copies of original photographs of Grace Olive Wiley. Here is Grace handling some venomous beaded lizards, teaching some children. Here she is loving on a king cobra. Here she is after they were filming for Trade Winds. Here she is petting a rattlesnake with, it just says an uncomfortable companion. Here she is with a Gila monster. And that's a, looks like a speckled rattlesnake. And she just has it comfortably intertwined around her neck. Grace was famous for being somewhat of a snake whisperer. And so here she is through the years with cobras and rattlesnakes. Oh, this is Grace's mother holding a king cobra under her tutelage. And here's a child that she's training to handle a king cobra. Now I'm not saying I condone this type of handling. What I'm saying is this lady is one of the founding matriarchs of our current industry and hobby of keeping snakes in captivity. Here are some more pictures. So here she is, this says Corporal Dickinson. So apparently she was in the services for some time. Well, it looks like I have some studying to do. I can't wait to dig my fangs into this. Big thanks to Mr. Jakes for sending this to me. I love it, I'm honored, I'm so excited. I am thankful for my struggle because without it, I wouldn't have stumbled across my strength. That was by Alex L. I just finished feeding and watering my teas and a couple of these critters just changed clothes. So this looks like a Smithi Hamori, so that's nice. It's always fun to see them grow up. And here's another one. I wanted to show you one of these smith eye that just shed because, as you know, they look especially beautiful after a new shed. This is one of my Brachypalma smith eye. Some people believe that smith eye actually was renamed as Hamori, but what was discovered was that there was a separate species that was classified as Hamori that actually came from a different area which had been previously misclassified as smith eye. So if you had a smith eye, you still have a smith eye, and some of the smith eyes were actually hamori. And there are very subtle differences, although it's very difficult to tell, this is a smith eye. Obviously, this is known as the Mexican red knee for very simple reasons to understand. Some of their segments are fiery orange or red, and they are especially beautiful. This is a slow-growing, yet relatively docile species, and one that I just love growing up because they're just so big and beautiful. The first time I ever saw this species was in Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, 
when Indiana goes into the cave and he's so brave and beautiful and it was so wild when those tarantulas started crawling all over him and he got really scared and I thought that's awesome I'd like to have some of those someday so here she is in the flesh Brecky Palma Smith by brand newly molted what kind of internet service do copperheads use I don't know tell me broadband there's no such thing as dial up copperhead mom I want a Lego set a Lego set are you bored yeah. I can give you something better this is like Legos for adults let's put the Zillow micro habitat together but mom this doesn't look anything like Legos do you think that maybe we could build it together let's do it Now wasn't that fun? Yes, I love you mommy. <laughs> I love you too. Zilla, fun for the whole family. What's the coldest type of reptile? I don't know what. A blizzard. <laughs> this is Crotalus lepidus lepidus, also known as the mottled rock rattlesnake. Like all rattlesnakes, they are a venomous viper. They do have a rattle on their tail. Here's a little fun fact about rattlesnakes. Some people believe that the buttons on their tail represent the number of years that they have been alive, but actually they get a new button each time they shed. However, you still cannot gauge a snake's age by how many buttons they have because there are occasions in which they lose all or some of the buttons off of their tail and have to start over. This is a North American species that is found in some areas in New Mexico, Texas, and into Mexico. They are an animal that dwell in like caves or rock cuts. And if you are a person who likes to go out and find snakes in the wild, this is an animal that you will find in the rock cuts. And that's where in Texas, Specifically, when they build a highway, they like to cut, they like to pave a straight road. And so if there's a hill, they will, they'll, I don't know, bulldoze, explode? Somehow they destroy the hill and build the road through it. So on the side of the road, there will be a, a straight cut of natural rocks. And the snakes will often hide out in there. Although not a dwarf or a pygmy species, this is a smaller rattlesnake. Although that does not mean that they are not a dangerous animal. Notice I'm using my equipment. I'm using a hook from Midwest Tongs and one of my other camera person is using my grabbers, which you can also use when you're filming, which is very convenient. That was a tip from Luby747 and I'll link his interview below. So one attribute of Crotalus lepidus lepidus, which is a subspecies of lepidus, that people really like is that they're fairly highly variable. They're called the mottled rock rattlesnake because they are speckled. Although some of them have banding rather than spots, some of them are very pink depending on the location that they came from. This is a captive born animal that is very old that I've had in my collection for quite some time. This is a big old fat male and one that I really love having in my collection. Of course, anytime I go out into the field, I make sure that I have my venom lock in my pack. And so I'll make sure to link all my tools in the, cup, in the description box below. When it is obvious that a goal cannot be reached, don't adjust the goal, adjust the action steps. Confucius. Who heard about the rat snake that was trying to sell jokes? I heard they were corny.
This is Rukia, and she's my child. She's better behaved than most children, and you can crate her if she acts up. But I find that she loves to run and play, and really she gets a lot of exercise. She's a good dog, but she's a nervous Nelly. She was a rescue, and we really appreciate her having her. I think that she's lucky to have us, and we're lucky to have her. And we love her. She is a goober. And I bet if I sit you down, you're going to run off to go play, huh? You're going to go play? She loves me. <laughs> and now it's time for Deadly Fairy Fables. <laughs> So this is a new segment we're going to do where I tell original tales from an English teacher, me. This is the original tale of how Lubricus got his stripes. Eons ago, the lions of the sub-Saharan savanna had orange and black stripes like the beautiful noble tiger. And Lubricus was just a sandy colored snake and he kind of envied the lion's beautiful stripes. So back at this time, Sub-Saharan Africa was a lush, beautiful jungle, and over time, the world began to change, and it turned into an arid savanna. Well, the lion and his pride began struggling to catch their prey because they could no longer blend in with their surroundings. And he noticed little Lubricus was able to blend in with the beautiful landscape. And so one day the lion began boasting to Lubricus about his beautiful stripes and convinced Lubricus to trade, are you getting sleepy? His scales for his coat. And so in the blink of an eye, a Spitalaps Lubricus became the orange and black striped coral cobra and the lion became the beautiful tawny brown lion that we know today. And the lion was able to successfully take care of his pride and the lionesses were able to hunt and care for their prides and poor little Lubricus had to become a semi-fossorial nocturnal hunter where he could hide his beautiful snakes from his prey. And I guess Cairo is now ready for bed and that is the end of this tale. And don't worry, no animals were harmed in the telling of this tale. Hope you guys enjoyed this one and we'll see you guys next time. What do you call a reptile with magic powers? I don't know. A wizard. I'll leave now. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, thank you so much for watching.